Good morning. Good morning. Hey, it's good to see everyone this morning. Uh, you know, I have said it before and I'll say it again. God loves you. He loves you just as you are. He wants you to do better, though, all the time. And so, everyone here, please know that you are loved by God. You are loved by the congregation. We're glad to have you here this morning. This morning, we're continuing on looking at Jesus' life and the teachings that he was giving us as he went along. And so we're following his life chronologically, looking at the different things that we experience as Jesus taught with those he encountered. And in our last lesson, we examined Jesus, and he was teaching to Nicodemus, and he was teaching him the necessity of the new birth. Now, John 3, it ends with John the baptizer and testifying that it is Jesus that the people are now to follow. And so up to this time, he had had his own disciples, but he has now turned them to Jesus. And it's interesting that John's words to his disciples, they're much like the words that Nicodemus used to acknowledge that Jesus uh, could not do what he did unless God was with him. Notice what we read in John chapter 3. In John chapter 3, and verse 27, John the baptizer says, a man who received nothing unless it had been given to him from heaven. That's kind of a lot like about what Nicodemus said in John chapter 3, uh, uh, verse 2. And so no one can do these things unless God be with him. And John could not have done what he had done unless it had been the will of God. Now, that didn't take anything away from the free will of John the baptizer. He still had free will. He could have made his own choice. But, of course, God being omniscient, he knows the future. He knows all things. He can use them to his advantage. And so we see John fulfilling what God will. But also, Jesus now, he is the one that all power and authority lies with, and he is the one we're to listen to. And so, John the baptizer, he has fulfilled his mission to prepare the way, and now he is turning that over to the rightful uh, source or place that it should belong, and to Jesus. As the leaders also, uh, when we think about Jesus, you know, they question, where did this authority come from? Take verses like Matthew 21 and verse 23. So John recognized it. John was prepared away, so he has done that. He steps aside for Jesus. He says, I must decrease and he must increase. But notice, John didn't step back and stop doing anything at all. John was still doing what he was supposed to do, to preach of the Christ and direct people to the Christ and prepare them for the Christ. But now the Christ has come. Yeah, he doesn't stop completely but he directs the people to Jesus. John 3 ends by saying, He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Now, he who believes, this is probably one of the most divisive statements in the Bible. It is Jesus, as the Son of God, who has the one who uh, gives us eternal life. We will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And in Matthew 3, verse 11, John said, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry, and he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Now, we examined these passages in our past lesson. Uh, these are not two different baptisms, but it's the division of those who will believe and they will receive, so that they will obey the gospel. And then there are those who reject it. They're not going to obey it, and they will be lost. John's words here are similar as it has always been that those by faith will also be obedient to the message preached. Salvation is never, has never, is still never, and won't be a matter of faith only. Faith leads to obedience. But those who are not obedient do not have true faith. And therefore, they will not see eternal life, but rather they will experience the wrath of God. Now, the setting here, this is what we are looking at as we come into John chapter 4. Again, a quick reminder, the chapter and verse divisions, those little numbers on the side of your Bible, those didn't exist in the original text. Those are there for our reading. Uh, it makes it easy for reading when you can see a verse number and a chapter number. Uh, you can use it for memory. 
conversation. You can use it for quick reference. But they didn't exist in the original text. And so we have to remember uh, not always let a number on a page separate the teachings for reading. And there are a couple of occasions in the Bible where we see that the teaching goes into the next chapter. Now, John 4 then starts the continuation, actually, from John 3 and verse 22. This is a continuing thought. When Matthew wrote, when John wrote, when Luke wrote, when Paul wrote, they were writing either to churches or to individuals uh, or to, to some group. They, they had an intended audience, and they're writing like a letter. And they must use chapters in the letter letter. Our thoughts move on. And sometimes we come back to a previous thought. Well, we see the same here. John 4 then starts with the continuation of John 3, verse 22, when we read, After these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea, and there he remained with them and baptized. Due to the confusion from some of John's disciples, you know, here, here you are, John, baptizing, but now Jesus, the guy you baptized yesterday, he's over here and he's baptizing more people than you. There was some jealousy. And so Jesus doesn't want to cause any issues. Uh, also, this is too early in his uh, uh, preaching career and his mission to stir up any you know, unwanted uh, observation and, and possibly you know, turn the Pharisees to him too early in his preaching career that would hinder his continued preaching. And so we read, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee. And it is here in his journey, however, that we are told that he needed to go through Samaria. John chapter 4 and verse 4. And we're going to be in John 4 for most of our lesson. When we view the relationship between the Jews and the Samaritans, uh, needless to say, it was not a good relationship. Most of the Jews en route to Jerusalem, they would actually go around Samaria uh, through Korea, even though going through Samaria was the most direct route. Uh, but this was east of the Jordan. They take that longer route rather than have to deal with the Samaritans. So there was a hostility between the Jews and the Samaritans, as we'll see. And this is this deep-seated prejudice in these two peoples uh, caused them to divert around. But Jesus had no such prejudice. He just trekked out. He went straight through Samaria. But also in this, there is a purpose. Because even from the Old Testament, it talked about the Gentiles being included in God's plan. That would include the Samaritans. And so Jesus, as his mission is to save the lost of all the nations, of all the world, he goes through Samaria. Now this is the background as it brings us to our first lesson for today. We see that we have to overcome prejudice. As we begin John chapter 4, we see that Jesus is chosen again to go through Samaria, and, and it's here that he encounters the Samaritan woman at the well. Uh, we'll look at later in another lesson, we talk about the good Samaritan. And you know, here's one that was thought to be unworthy, he, he was uh, you know, unclean, and he was immoral, but he turns out to be known throughout history as the good Samaritan. Well, here Jesus encounters this woman uh, at the well, and there's a conversation that takes place between them that we'll see covers a couple of different things. Uh, now, to give you a little background on the Samaritans and this hostility between them and the Jews, there was a difference in regards to the place of worship. The Samaritans had opposed the reconstruction of the temple back in 538 BC. Uh, we read of this in Ezra chapter 1. In Ezra chapter, or I'm sorry, Ezra chapter 4, beginning in verse 1 through verse 5. And we read of how the Samaritans had originally wanted to help with the rebuilding when the Jews came back from captivity. And so it says here on how the Samaritans they wanted to help, but they described them as adversaries of Judah and Benjamin. Verse 1 of Ezra 4. And these people, we have to understand the Samaritans, they were not Jews. They were people that under the Assyrian uh, captivity, it was a natural thing that we don't want the people to rebel. So what we'll do is we'll take some of you from over here, we're going to move you over to this land, we're going to take some of the people from that land, we're going to move them into your land, and they would switch them around. It's hard to unite and rebel when you're scattered. And so this was a practice they had. Ezra 4, verse 2 shows, it says that the Samaritans, that they came to Zerubbabel, the heads of the father and the heads of the father's houses, and said to them, let us build with you, for we seek your God as you do, and 
and we have sacrificed to him since the days of, listen to this, Esaharam, king of Assyria, who brought us here. So these are not Jews. Now, later on, we read the scripture, they were having difficulties, they sent a priest to teach them the, the Judaism, but they're not Jews. And as such, they worship God, that part was true, but because they were not Jews, they had come from various different areas, they had blended it with whatever religions they had previously. And they had corrupted the worship of God with idolatry, and so rightly, Israel rejects their help. You cannot have any fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. We read of this in Ephesians 5 and verse 11. It says, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. Well, 1 John 1, verse 7, tells us to have fellowship. We must be walking in the light. If we are walking in the light, we have fellowship together. We have fellowship with Jesus Christ. If we're not in the light, then we have no fellowship. And so we see this is what happens between the Samaritans and the Jews when they were trying to rebuild. Now, the obligation of the Christian is to shed light. Now, Ephesians 4, we're doing it in truth and love. And so this love is to reprove those who are in sin. But we're not to have any prejudice in that. We are to take and treat all the same. All are in equal need of salvation. All are in equal need of the gospel. And so we are not to let prejudice also hinder us from sharing the gospel. You see, what was prevalent in this day, the attitude is prejudice between the Jews and the Samaritans. And we see that Jesus encounters that when he meets this woman at the well. Notice that when the woman comes to the well, and Jesus asks her for a drink, look at her response in John chapter 4, verses 7 and 9. She says, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? And then we have a note here that says, for the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. And guess what? The opposite is true, too. And so the Jews looked at him again as being immoral, unclean, uh, less than you know, desirable. And this long-seated prejudice was still in effect nearly 500 years later when Jesus meets this woman at the well. But Jesus had love for all. And that's how we should be. We should have love for all. And also in Jesus speaking to this woman, he overcomes many ethnic, moral, and gender barriers. Due to the ethnic conflict between the Jews and the Samaritans, this hostility between the two groups, think about it. There is probably little chance of having any interaction due to convey the word of God. You know, if, you, if you look at somebody as less desirable and you look to avoid it, we're going to go all the way through the region of Korea so we don't even have to go through Samaria. How are you going to teach them of God? And so we have to overcome a prejudice. And then we see Jesus, he had it. He lets love rather than God. And also, uh, we see the two, the woman and Jesus, they're alone at the well. The men have gone, the disciples have gone into the city to get food. And so there's this gender barrier, as many case ages warned against women. Uh, they warned why, the, uh, you know, and this is why the disciples marvel that he spoke to her when they come back from the city with food, as we get in John 4, in verse 27. But this is because the, the uh, sages of the day, they said that, you know, being alone with a woman, they, one could easily fall into temptation. And uh, that it could damage your reputation. And so they warned against this idea of being alone with a woman. However, in regards to the universal need for salvation, uh, Paul tells us in Galatians 3, verse 28, there's neither male nor female. Talks about how there's neither Greek, there's neither slave or free. But we're all one in Christ Jesus. Well, we also, as we're going to be all one in Christ Jesus, we need not let any one be excluded from the teachings of Jesus. And so, again, we have to overcome these things. He also overcame the moral barrier. Jesus tells the woman, for you have had five husbands, and the one who you are with now is not your husband, in verse, 20, or verse 18. And so, again, uh, this would be, uh, he was you know, associating with her. Uh, there's some ideas that she had come to the well here at noon. She was either coming at noon at the hottest part of the day. She's alone. Uh, possibly that some of the thought is that people knew her relationship status, and she had been kind of shunned by the others in the city, and so she's here at the well now by herself at the hottest part of the day rather than the morning or the evening when the other women would be there. But she's been kind of, you know, pushed away.
way. But Jesus, he talks to us. He, he, he has no problem with it. And so this is an important note for us. And then Jesus starts speaking of the living water. And this is a condition of the recipient of such to have, you know, reform their moral condition. There needs to be repentance in order to receive the living water. And so he's giving her an opportunity. And the truth is brought out when Jesus is asking her to go get her husband. Uh, verse 16. He's told her about this living water. She's excited about the living water. Well, you would want to share this with your husband, right? Why don't you go get your husband? Jesus is very wise. He already knows ahead of time. But he's giving her the opportunity to be honest. Now, she had had five husbands, and the one she was now with, her sixth man, was not her husband. Tell us in verse 18. Now, her sin was not in the number of marriages she had had. Uh, we'll cover divorce and remarriage in a later lesson if we get to that point with uh, Jesus' teachings. But she is now living in a marital relationship with a man she is not married to, that she has no right to. That they should not be in this, you know, relationship of husband and wife. Uh, and so her sin then is fornication. This is what Jesus is addressing. This is what's being brought out. And what she needs to repent of. She needs to turn away from that. And, and again, if it's true that she has been kind of shunned by the others of the village and of the city, Sakar, and that's why she's in the well by herself, and it's well known. And so she needs to repent of this sin. And he asked, this is just another example of Jesus' omissions. He knew what was in people. He knew what they needed. And so he also, from love and a lack of prejudice, he had no problem in speaking to these types of individuals. And so he went to her, and he speaks to her out of love. He gives her the opportunity to repent. He doesn't accuse her. He doesn't lay a guilt trip on her. He simply calls the fact the truth, and lets her confront it herself. Well, figuring also prominently into this encounter with the Samaritan woman, there's two aspects of difference in the Jewish and the Samaritan religious practices. The first one we kind of looked at was the place of worship. Now, originally the Samaritans had come, they wanted to help rebuild the temple, and the wall there was the Roll and Ezra and Nehemiah, but they weren't allowed to because of the conditions we spoke of. And so there became a difference in their place of worship. Now, the first place of worship, uh, or the first place of worship, as the Jews worshiped in Jerusalem and the Samaritans out of Mount Gerizim. And this is the place of the blessings that were called down when the Jews entered Canaan. Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 29, also Deuteronomy 27, verse 12. And so the Samaritans, they rejected the books of the prophets. They only used the first five books of the Bible. And they didn't recognize then Jerusalem as being the place of worship. And Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 5, and, and especially that verse in that chapter, but Deuteronomy 12 would be one of the books that was used by the Samaritans. And it's funny, we were just reading, uh, our, our night was reading with the kids, I was reading from Deuteronomy 12 just uh, was it last night or night before last. And so um, here, it stated that they should not worship as those who were in Canaan who God was driving out. You're not to worship like that. You know, using idols and things like that. We talked about that this morning in the Bible class. We were talking to Paul at, uh, at Athens. But they should seek God. And in verse 12, or verse 5 of Deuteronomy 12, it says, But you shall seek the place where the Lord your God chooses out of all your tribes to put his name for his dwelling place, and there you shall go. So they know when we come into the promised land, or when the Jews came into the promised land, that God was going to give them a place of worship. Now, however, in not, 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 not acknowledging any other books past the Pentateuch, those first five books by Moses, the Samaritans didn't receive any further revelation. They didn't know that as God had said, when you go into the land, in Deuteronomy 12, when you go into the land and you possess the land and you divide it up into your, your tribes, your possessions, your inheritance, then I will name from one of the tribes where I'll place my worship. Well, again, they had worshiped at Mount Gerizim because this is where the blessings were called down. The Israelites came into the promised land. 
promised land. They were up on Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal, the people were in the valley. They called down the blessings from Mount Gerizim, the curses from Mount Ebal. And so the Samaritans, well, Mount Gerizim is where God is. And that's where they worship. Well, had they accepted the books of the prophets, such as Samuel, for instance, and he records that David's desire to build a house for God in 2 Samuel chapter 7. Now, of course, David wasn't permitted to do so because he was a man of war. He had blood on his hands, but he raised the funds. And his son Solomon, he then built the temple in Jerusalem. And we read 2 Samuel 7, 10 to 11. Uh, however, there was also a prophecy here of the Messiah. Because listen to what God says to David when we read 2 Samuel 7, beginning in verse 12. When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you, and you and, uh, uh, who will come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Now, this may sound like Solomon, and probably David had envisioned Solomon, but Solomon's throne was not forever. Also, he says, I will be his father. He shall be my son. Who do we know that he is referred to in this manner? Now, we'll look at this a little closer in a moment, but let's go on. If he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the blows of the sons of men. But my mercy shall not depart from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I removed from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be established again, he says, forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. Now, there are times when we read in the Old Testament that it uses the word forever, and it means for a season, for a time. So it's not eternal. But there are times when we read of, and he talks about being eternal. And it does have a meaning of eternity. And so we see context and other passages help us to understand this. But here he's talking about this eternal, forever throne. It doesn't exist in the real world. There's not a nation that stands for eternity. They fall, they rise, they're conquered. All these things happen. And so while the worship was brought to Jerusalem, it wouldn't remain there. And earthly kingdoms, again, they don't last forever. However, we also know from Matthew chapter 1, that guess what? Jesus is the son of David. We read of him being born. That's the whole reason they went to Jerusalem and, and you know, to the city of David, because that's where you know, his father was from. Uh, so we read that in Matthew 1. And, however, when we look to David, his last earthly descendant who reigned upon the throne was Jeconiah. And it read, if we were to look at the Old Testament quite a bit, Jeconiah had no sons. Well, Jeconiah actually did have sons. But what he did, he had no sons that sat on the throne. And so after Jeconiah, there was not a son of David sitting on the throne in Israel. And so this kingdom of eternity, the spirit, is a spiritual kingdom. Jesus is a living temple in whom baptized believers are living stones in. In John 2, in verse 19, it talks about being a living temple. 1 Peter 2, verse 5, you and I were living stones in the temple. And when Jesus had asked this woman for a drink, uh, the woman immediately questions him to this place of worship. Where is it that we are to worship? And perceiving Jesus to be a Jew, in verse 9 there of John chapter 4, she asks. And now by Jewish standards, Samaritans were unclean. Again, so Jesus' request confused her when she asked for a drink of water. Uh, possibly because of this, she thought, well, maybe he's not that religious. You know, he's going to talk to me. You know, he doesn't have an issue with that. And so perhaps he's not very religious. But then they have this discussion about living water. And then they talk about her five husbands. And the woman says, Sir, I perceive that you're a prophet, beginning in verse 19. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. Now here they are sitting at the well, and actually the mountains in the background, you know, our fathers worshiped on this mountain. But you Jews, you, you say Jerusalem. That's the place we ought to worship. Now, she had gone from perceiving Jesus to be a Jew to Sir, also translated Lord. Uh, it's also used by Saul on the road to Damascus when we read Acts chapter 9. 
And now she goes to Potiphar. You're a Jew, sir, Potiphar. And so we know that faith comes by hearing and hearing from the Word of God. And that's what's happening here. She's learning, she's growing in her faith, she now proceeds him to be a prophet, and she has a question of religious interest. And that's apparently is something that's been on her mind. It's something she has thought about. And it's something that obviously has troubled her that now she asks the question, where should we worship? And she's hitting really upon a question that is very relevant to all of us. Even today, how should I be worshiping God so as to be pleasing to him? She wants to know. Is it on the mountain? Is it in Jerusalem? How is it we are to worship? And despite what some may teach, we cannot worship God in any manner that we like and be pleasing to God. The Bible is full of examples of improper worship. Such as Nadab and Abihu, when we read Leviticus chapter 10, verse 1, they thought they could offer strange fire, and fire was not authorized. Or what about Malachi 1, 6 through 14, and it just talks about the, the, the need for proper worship. Or Deuteronomy 12, when they were commanded to worship not like those in the land that you're going in to possess. The reason that you're going in to possess the land is not because you're mightier than others. It's not because you're so great. It's not because you're so righteous. It's because you're Jesus then proceeds to tell her of proper worship in John chapter 4, beginning in verse 21. Now, Jerusalem had been the proper place of worship. But he makes it known that there is a new system coming. There is about to be a new way initiated through him. And the place that he worship isn't going to matter. It's not going to matter whether it's on the mountain. It's not going to matter if it's in Jerusalem. God's not worshiping things made by man. He tells her rather that the worship needs to be in spirit and in truth. And what we saw earlier, the Samaritans that worship God, their worship is polluted with idolatry. It wasn't in spirit. Because they mixed other things in it, if they had true spirit, they would have been mindful of God's commandments. They would have been mindful of God's pattern. And so it wasn't in spirit, and it wasn't in truth. Well, the Samaritans here, they polluted the idea of worship. And Jesus also heard the Old Testament prophecies concerning the Messiah. As he said that salvation is from the Jews. Jesus was born of a Jew. He was Jewish by birth. And it's earthly sense. And so, in that matter, the prophecies are true that the salvation is going to come through the Jews. Uh, he is the descendant of David. These are all fitting prophecies. In fact, Matthew focuses a lot on fulfilled prophecy in the book of Matthew. But John here, he, he has a different purpose. And so he talks about salvation is from the Jews. It is. Worship, though, is not without destruction. And relating to the things better in Christ, the Hebrew writer he says of the priest that in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 5, and this relates to Exodus 25 and verse 40, he says of the priest who serves the copy and shadow of the heavenly things. And so they're, they're, they're a shadow, they're a copy. He says that Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle, for he said, see that you make all things according to the pattern. Shown to you on the mountain. Well, just as Moses had to follow the instruction of God in making the tabernacle, and making of the priest's clothing, the, the table of showbread, all of those things, the sacrifices, they had to be according to the path, to the way God has shown them. And today, we do have a pattern for worship. It's shown to us in the New Testament. We think of verses like 2 Timothy 1 and verse 3, talking about the pattern. We can only worship God in two ways. We can worship Him in the way that He has prescribed and He has revealed to us through His Word, or we can worship Him our way. Matthew chapter 15, verses 8 and 9, it talks about teaching His commandments, the doctrines of men, and it says that this is vain worship. It's empty. It's worthless. You know, think about it today. If you tell somebody you want them to build you a shed in your backyard and you want it five feet wide and you want it four feet deep and you want it eight feet tall and you want a 30 degree pitch roof and they don't build it that way. 
that what you asked for? Is that the pattern you gave them? Would you say, oh, I, mean, I know it's exactly what I had envisioned in my mind? Or would you say, this is not according to the pattern? And when we come to worship, it has to be according to the pattern God has given us. Otherwise, it is vain worship. It's empty. It's useless. And so for worship to be acceptable, it has to be as the Lord instructs, and it has to be in sincerity. In fact, Jesus condemns some, even Isaiah. Is that Isaiah 11, verse 1? There shall come from forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Well, this is all true. The Messiah, he's being narrowed down. It's going to be from Abraham's seed. Now it's going to be from Israel. Now it's going to be from Judah. Now it's going to be from David. David is the one, the apostle. We don't even look at this. You know, they, they appeal to the fact that Jesus was the son of David on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, verse 29 and following. However, the Jews also expected the Messiah to be like David. This warrior king. They expected him to overthrow the yoke and the bondage of the Romans. They expected him to reestablish the earthly nation of Israel, to reestablish the kingdom of Israel. In Isaiah 9, verses 6 and 7, it says, For unto us a child is born, for unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. And it's giving down a little look. The increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from the time from that time forward and forever. When we think about this, God, government has everlasting peace. Jeconiah was the last earthly king to sit on the throne. They spent hundreds of years. We see the judgment and justice. What judgment and justice has ever been fully right? When we look at earthly kings. Unfortunately, they took these the very literal of the Messiah. Of him establishing an earthly kingdom. Although when we look at Jesus himself and talking to Pilate in John 18 and verse 36, he said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my my, my disciples, my followers, they'd rise up and they'd fight that I should not be delivered over to you. It's not an earthly kingdom. Pilate had no need to fear Jesus as king as far as the earthly king. He wasn't about to rebel and overthrow the government. Even Jesus' own disciples are they had difficulties with understanding. Such as in Acts chapter 1, Jesus' instruction before his ascension for them to go to Jerusalem. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 3 it says, Being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God, but being promised the Holy Spirit would come, they asked, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? Acts 1 and verse 6. They still didn't fully understand. They were still looking at earthly material you know, in, their, in their vision. They were failing to see the spiritual. So it happened with Nicodemus. It was happening with the woman at the well. Sometimes we do not perceive the spiritual. Well, the Samaritans, they had a different expectation of the Messiah. They looked at him as being one like Moses. Deuteronomy chapter 18, beginning in verse 15, it says of Moses, uh, where he says, The Lord your God will raise up a prophet like me from your midst, from your brethren, and you shall hear. Now this is obviously speaking of the Messiah in these verses. The Samaritans are clearly correct in looking to the Messiah as this. And when we look at Moses, you know, he was a spokesman for God before the people. He was a mediator between the people and God. He performed miracles. He provided the law and the teaching. And so, yeah, he's going to be one like me. But he's going to be one greater, as the Hebrew writer tells us. In John chapter 1, verse 45, Philip said to Nathaniel, We have found him, guess this, of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Their acknowledging, yes. Just as Moses wrote, this is the Messiah, Jesus, the son of Joseph. Jesus also translated as such when he said in John chapter 5, and verse 46, For if you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. Also, Peter and Stephen, they recognized Jesus as 
prophet that Moses spoke of. And we read Acts chapter 3, 22 and 23, and Acts 7, verse 37. And if there is any doubt at all, God himself declared on two occasions, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, hear him. Who did Moses say we were to hear? The prophet that God would raise up like me. Who did God himself say to hear? My son Jesus. Who did Jesus say he was? The one that Moses and the prophet spoke about. The problem, though, is each of these, again, they were looking at a very literal view of things. They were failing to see the spiritual application. And so when we look at this, the problem would be the Jews, the Samaritans, Jesus, the disciples, even some today, they failed to see Jesus for who he really is. That was a large problem during Jesus' earthly ministry. People did not see him for who he was, but they looked at him through the rose-colored glasses of what they perceived the Messiah was going to be. Even here, the Samaritan woman, again, she's taken the, uh, had taken the water to which Jesus spoke to him, and literal at first. Uh, Jesus, knowing people's hearts, he knew this woman would respond to a genuine opportunity to know the truth. And Jesus uses the water uh, to stand here for spiritual realities that would lead to eternal life. Now, the metaphor and him using this water most likely was brought about by both of them being at the well together. They obviously were at the well. She was there to gather the water. She had need of the water. He asked for a drink. He had need of the water. The body requires water to live. And just as the spirit requires an everlasting fountain that comes from the word of God. And so he uses this opportunity for the water to teach. This is also seen in Jesus' comment regarding later the food when the disciples return, and he says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work when they try to urge him to eat, and he you know, refused. And we'll look at next week. But they were confused. You know, surely you need to eat, but no, my food is to do the will of the Father. Sadly, again, like Nicodemus and new birth, she's not thinking spiritually. And she has trouble understanding that this gift that God is offering her is one of everlasting life that comes from the truth of him being the Messiah. And he being the one who gives eternal life. And she doesn't understand Jesus is not talking about the water in the well. She proceeds to question him further about this water. And finally, Jesus says, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again and be taken to the well. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him, he will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become unto him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. John 4, verses 13 and 14. Jesus declares that what he has to offer leads to eternal life. It's a gift that cannot be merited. And it is to this water, though still not fully understanding, that the woman asks her to give. Now, we may not always fully know how it is that God will bless us, but Jesus has told us, if we abide in, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. John 15, verse 7. She asked for his love. She was sincere in heart. And so Jesus begins to speak to her. And he tells her again of her five husbands. And the more they converse, the more she believed. The more they conversed, the more her faith grew. And finally, it leads her to see Jesus not as a Jew, not as a servant, not as a prophet. It knows what she says. I know the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Notice later when she goes to the village, to, to the town, and she tells people, you know, come out and meet a man who told me all the things I've ever done. Now, obviously, Jesus didn't tell all things, but notice what he said. He will tell us all things. Jesus, with no uncertainty, in verse 26, says, I who speak to you as he, referring to this Messiah that was to come. Her belief is shown in her urgency to tell others by her leaving her well, by her leaving her uh, water pot at the well. She has walked out here. In noonday, I, 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 I remember right, I think it was two football field lengths to get there. And so she, even today, 
She's left her water pot there to go back to tell people in the town and invite them. In John chapter 4, verse 29, it says, Come, see a man who told me all things that I ever did. He didn't tell her everything. He told her enough stuff that it established faith in her. Her words are worth nothing. Again. Her words are not words of disbelief. They're not words of doubt. Listen to what she says. Could this be the Christ? We might read that as doubt. But when we understand what she is saying in the original language, and this is part of her invitation to come and see for themselves. She didn't want to put any preconceived notions in their ideas. She didn't want to sway them or influence them in one way. Come, see for yourself. Come and see. You know what Nathaniel said, or uh, the Pope said to Nathaniel? Come and see. Jesus invites us to learn from him. And then to make our own decision. That's what the woman did. And we see that exactly is what happened because in verses 39 to 42, the women do, the men do come out from the city and, and they sit there and Jesus teaches them. And then they later say, it wasn't because of what the woman said, but because of what Jesus said. Samaritan woman provides us with several good examples, several good lessons in the Messiah and our obligations as Christians. The first thing is in sharing the gospel, we need to get prejudice out of the way. You know, I've talked about it in previous lessons. Prejudice has no place in God's kingdom. And so we need to get that out of our minds. In sharing the gospel, we must never let prejudice get in our way of who we think is worthy to hear the gospel. We just sow the seed. God will give the increase. Our love should be for everybody. It shouldn't be hindered by personal considerations. And all our need for salvation. Also, in our worship, we need to make sure we're following the pattern God has given us for worship today. And we're worshiping in spirit and in truth. And also, we need to learn to recognize the Messiah for who he is. Take him for who he is. And not try to put our own preconceived ideas of what we think the Messiah should be. Too many today, they like to keep Jesus as that baby in the manger. You know why? Baby can't talk. Baby can't correct you. Baby actually is teachable and is influenced by those it sees. And they would like the Lord to be that way. Let us influence the Lord and let him be agreeable to what we want. And lastly, in addition to not letting prejudice hinder our sharing of Jesus, we need to be sharing. We need to take every opportunity to hear Jesus say in the well, waiting for the disciples to come back to food. He sees this woman, and he takes the opportunity to share the gospel with her. Time and again, we have seen those who have heard, they believe, and then they brought others to Christ. This morning, has someone brought you to Christ? Think back in the past. Who was it that shared the gospel? Do you have fond memories of that person? I, I, in the back of my Bible, I have from the memorial service from Bill Moore. Take the back of my Bible. That's the gentleman who came over to my house each week, sat down, and talked about the gospel with me. We all have somebody like that. And if he did accept the gospel, And if you're here and you have never read the gospel, what does that even mean? It means that we need to come to an understanding that Jesus is the Christ, that he is the Son of the living God, that he died for our sins on the cross, that he was dead and buried, he was raised from the grave, and he is coming back one day for those who are his. If you haven't obeyed the gospel, turn to that belief. And then a desire to change your life, to reform it, to be pleasing to God. And then it calls for us to confess our belief before others and to be buried in the water where we are baptized into Christ. It is at this point he forgives our sins. He unites us with one another. He unites us with Christ. And he adds us to his church. If we can help anyone this morning with his prayers uh, for, for trouble in life and his further study, 
or you're at the point where you desire to be baptized in Christ, we all give the opportunity this morning together to come to you. There's a great day.